Dr. Natalie von Siemens has been managing director and spokesperson of the board of Siemens Stiftung since January 2013. Together with her board colleagues, Rolf Huber and Gerd Bers Weiser, she is responsible for the operative implementation of the goals defined by the foundation. Siemens Stiftung operate in the fields of basic services, education and culture. As a hands-on foundation, Siemens Stiftung develops its own projects and implements them with a focus on a long term. In collaboration with its partners organizations, the aim is to help people improve their living conditions. In her role as a member of the board, Natalie von Siemens is also responsible for matters related to education and culture. As part of her operational responsibility, she also serves as spokesperson for the National STEM Forum. Before joining the Siemens Stiftung Boards of Directors, Natalie von Siemens worked at Siemens AG in the area of areas of leadership development, corporate strategies, investor relations, and corporate communications. In these positions, she focused on the issues of value-based sustainable corporate development. Earlier, Natalie von Siemens worked in the academic sector. Her research covered, among other things, moral philosophy, and business ethics. She earned her doctorate in 2004 with a dissertation about the meaning of friendship in the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle. Dr. Natalie von Siemens is a member of a supervisory board of Siemens AG, Siemens Healthcare, GmbH, and Messer Group, GmbH. Please welcome Natalie from Simmons. Imagine you're 15 years of age, unemployed, with no school leaving qualification, and you're standing in line at the employment office. The first thing they do is give you a form to fill out, but it's really hard for you to answer the questions because you've never learned properly to read and write. But somehow you manage to complete the form and are fortunate enough to be sent to a recently built factory that is desperately looking for personnel. They need 300 employees to work on a modern production line. And because they are so desperate with the lack of skilled people, they offer on-the-job training. First, however, you need to pass an assessment test, obviously online. They just give you an iPad as the production line is highly automated and digitalized. Because you have only a, f a very basic knowledge of mathematics and natural sciences, let alone computing, this presents you with enormous problems as well. What do you think your chances are of being selected for one of the trainee positions? Probability is high, you go back to your friends around the corner and help them in drug trafficking. And this isn't just a problem for young people with indigenous or migration background who lack a school leaving qualification. PISA has shown the true extent of this dilemma, even in Germany, the home of Wilhelm von Humboldt and a country with a proud engineering tradition. The first PISA study published in 2000 revealed that German students were significantly below par compared to their peers in other countries. That was a real shock. In the meantime, however, many things have changed for the better, and that's the good news. If you can identify what needs to be done and tackle the problem systematically, you will achieve positive results. What's more, the very fact that PISA exists shows that mathematics and natural sciences are now considered core competencies throughout the world and ones that need to be fostered from an early age. Today, ladies and gentlemen, there can be no doubt that a solid STEM education is fundamental to success for individuals and the future of national economies, for social stability as well as social integration. As Carol said yesterday, STEM is the big equalizer. 
STEM subjects impact all areas of our lives, the environment, sustainability, climate change, energy generation, biology, and many, many more. There are significant interdependencies. And this is why we believe that scientific education, STEM education, is not only an economic necessity, it's a moral re responsibility. It's not only important for industrial value creation, it's important as a social enabler which fosters employability. It's a political enabler which enables broad technology, uh, technological understanding as integral part of our being mature citizens. And it's also vital for, uh, for uh, character and value building. This is also reflected in the United Nations Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, which Dato Lee already referred to. Last September, 193 world leaders formulated 17 goals for sustainable development, to end extreme poverty, to fight inequality and injustice, and to protect our planet. And one cannot repeat often enough, the UN particularly emphasized, and I quote, Education, and especially STEM education, is essential to reach these goals. There is simply no more powerful or longer-lasting investment in human rights and dignity, in social inclusion and sustainable development. The initial situation and the concrete challenges differ widely from country to country and from region to region. According to the United Nations, 58 million children around the globe still have no school education at all, a further 100 million fail to complete even their primary education. And as Pierre underlined yesterday, one billion is with very poor schooling. This is why the common education goal of Agenda 2030 is, quote, ensure inclusive and quality education for all and promote lifelong learning. In particular, to substantially increase the number of youth and adults who have relevant skills including technical and vocational skills for employment, decent jobs, and entrepreneurship. Ever since Siemens Stiftung was founded in 2008, a main focus has been placed on education and especially on STEM subjects. As a non-profit corporate foundation, we promo promote sustainable social development. We help local populations act responsibly and confront the challenges that face them on their own initiative. In order to do this, we cooperate with local partners to develop and implement joint solutions and programs. Each focus region has its own individual challenges. At the current time, we have three main working areas. First is basic needs. That means ensuring the supply of basic services in developing countries, especially access to clean drinking water and energy. The safe water enterprises in Kenya are an example of this. Around 40 million people there still have no access to clean drinking water. That is around 40% of the total population. Up to now, Siemens Stiftung has helped establish 13 safe water enterprises. These are kiosks that are operated by locals and provide clean drinking water at a reasonable price. To prepare them for their roles, these micro-entrepreneurs first take part in special entrepreneurship courses. In nearby schools, children perform pr practical experiments that teach them the importance of clean drinking water and hygiene. So, inquiry-based learning is not only for school. We believe this is an important way of increasing the likelihood that young people will continue living in their local areas. And this is especially important in times of the enormous migration we are facing. I am incredibly proud of my country that the Germans have welcomed so many refugees. And this is... Thank you. Thank you. Adam, I am incredibly proud of the Chancellor who just does not stop to say we're open. Yet, I believe people are happier, happier if they have a future at home. We had invited last November a group of, um, of educational entrepreneurs from African countries for, uh, for an entrepreneurship training to Berlin. It was fabulous, very innovative, great cooperation. 
And they had enjoyed it a lot. They said they loved it. For many of them, it was the first trip to abroad. But it was November in Berlin. It was very gray. And after three weeks, one of the, the students said, but look, guys, it's wonderful in Germany, but how can you live without sun? <laughs> so this is all also about cultural identity. This is the second pillar of our work. We see culture as a crucial key to understanding and communication within a society, particularly in times of transformation. Pierre, you have given important ways in, when, in which inquiry-based STEM education should change in the future, and I would like to humbly add we should include the arts. We should move from STEM to STEAM. This is why in the areas of music and performing arts, we support events, academies, and platforms that foster a debate on social cohesion. One example is Changing Places, a project that is currently ongoing in the historical Yungay area of Santiago. Over a period of 11 days, artists are transforming around 20 empty buildings and public spaces into places of encounter. Yungay, for those who, who have not been around in Santiago, is not only one of the most beautiful areas of Santiago with villas from the 18th and 19th century, but also one of the areas with the most problems and challenges. Poverty, unemployment, drug dealing, social fractures, and at the same time, real estate speculation forcing people to leave their homes. We were honored to open Changing Places, Espacios Relevados, in the presence of Mr. Otona, the Minister for Culture. Changing Places started um, with an artist playing the bell of the church at Plaza Yungay. This might seem very simple, but the church is a ruin which you cannot enter. And the people of Yungay had not heard the sound of the bell for 20 years. So it was not a question of being religious or not. More than 1,000 people were standing quietly listening to this bell for 15 minutes. Bing, 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 bing. Many of them actually crying. And for the, re for the rest of the evening, Yungay enjoyed a bit of the social cohesion it so desperately lacks. Another example is an intervention in Metalco, a deserted steel planet. The artists have planted trees in the ruin, and with the trees came songbirds, which now fill the place with their chirping. So the ruin of an industrial plant has transformed into something like a greenhouse, giving shelter to trees and birds. So by the way, Changing Places is scheduled to run until April 17, another two days, if you are free, it's well worth a visit. Our third and most important working area is education, with a particular focus on STEM subjects. In today's world, scientific and technical literacy, plus an understanding of interrelationships, are crucial factors in personal development and social inclusion. This is why we promote STEM education through work in committees and participation in educational operational projects. Inquiry-based learning, value-shaping activities, and the use of digital media. Schooling of this kind is fun and supports the molding of socially oriented and strong personalities. It is important that STEM is seen as a part of a holistic approach to education that extends across the entire educational chain. This is where our educational program Experimento comes in. Experimental focuses on the teaching of natural sciences, technology, and values. The program provides teachers with new methods in inquiry-based uh, learning, help them instill children with an enthusiasm for natural sciences, and communicate basic knowledge, stir interest in new technologies, and uh, explore new ideas, and last but not least, develop values and strengthen powers of judgment. Experimental uh, includes teacher training, and free online teaching materials. The program has 136 different experiments from the areas of energy, health, and the environment. But even more important than the experiment kits is the training that the teachers receive beforehand. After all, even the best material is useless if we lack good teachers. 
competent, dedicated teachers plus good material. That's the basis, basis for excellent teaching. In Germany, for example, 70% of teachers feel inadequately prepared for their job. 70%. From both a subject-related and an edu educational or pedagogical perspective. Similar figures are reported from other countries. This is why we re regard it as extremely important that teachers who want to use Experimento are appropriately trained before doing so. Bruce, you have pointed out how much easier it is to teach science poorly, but teachers can learn from their pu pupils and they can learn from each other. So we provide teachers with handouts for themselves and worksheets for their pupils and encourage them to take advantage of our networks to exchange knowledge. They are also able to access our global online platform where you can download extensive additional material free of charge. These open educational resources, and we heard the term um, in this morning sessions, are a key part of Experimento. Despite calls from UNESCO and OECD, there is still a lack of free, high-quality teaching material, particularly in developing and emerging countries. Such material is vital in order to promote children's media literacy and ensure equal educational opportunities. In the modern world, digital competencies are definitely part of the school of life, and we cannot allow children's opportunities in life to be limited by their place of birth or the financial resources of their parents. Every child has a right to education, and we have to give them every possible support, also online. Open education resources should always be regarded as supplementing traditional school books. Assuming they are adequately maintained, digital media are up-to-date tools that are also ideal for trying out new approaches and bringing variety to lessons. I mean, I think in Germany, to come up with a new school book, it takes you about 10 years from the inception of the first idea to, the, to publication of the book, which obviously ensures quality, but hey, 10 years is a long time nowadays. So this is why we are gradually transferring all the materials in Siemens Stiftung's online media portal to the OER format. More than 5,500 items of teaching material will then be available for access, comprising information sheets, instruction for experiments, worksheets and solution sheets, interactive graphics, simulations, videos, and a whole lot more. These digital media encourage self-managed learning, keep children in sync with the modern world, and are fun to work for, with. Experimento special, uh, places a special focus on the development of personalities and values. While working as a team and learning about natural sciences and technology through inquiry, pupils need to permanently assess, deliberate, and decide. They improve their collaboration and communication skills and practice respect and tolerance. I mean, if we go in an experiment where, for example, we do a little battery made out of a lemon, and there's only one lemon on this table, and five kids who have to work it, well, they have to take turns or make an argument whose turn it is. So this whole thing promotes communication. So they improve their collaboration and communication skills and practice respect and tolerance, values that are becoming increasingly important both in the working world and for social development in, in general. Children acquire these learning-related values by working as a team to solve problems and discover scientific phenomena. The children need to shape their own learning process, so they are, they are responsible for their own learning. This encourages them to do things on their own initiative while also promoting socialization. There's one example I, I always like to cite, which comes from Medellin in Colombia, a city that is notorious for its, it, it, its extreme violence, but is striving to eradicate it. It is trying to do this by means of an education turnaround, on which the city is spending a large portion of the budget. Teachers and educational psychologists who are working with Experimento in Medellin report that experimentation in teams is not only awakening pupils' interest in STEM subjects, but is also changing the way they behave. So violence and aggressive tendencies have tendencies have decreased in the experimental classes, 
while levels of self-confidence and social behavior are improving significantly. After all, if a child manages to finish his experiment, finish the electrical circuit, and then the little light goes on, then I am the cause for something to happen. So this gives just a lot of confidence. I can do things. So inquiry-based learning within a team stirs curiosity and is fun to participate in. At the same time, concrete involvement with topics from the areas of health, energy, and environment also develops object-related values like responsibility, environmental awareness, and solidarity, because the children work with the topics. One approach we find very useful in this context of, um, of the object-related values is to work with value dilemmas. So pupils are encouraged to think about a particular topic. Designed for specific age groups, these exercises have no predetermined solutions and there are no right or wrong answers. So in a way, as we heard also yesterday, it's important that the, that the pupil defines his or her own problem. So the focus is not on the result, but on considering the consequences that every decision will bring. I'll give you a concrete example from, from the energy uh, work for the, for the age group seven to eight. The pupils have carried out an experiment about electricity and are now asked to consider why saving electricity is so important and how they could save electricity themselves. So the teacher can employ the sister light dilemma introduced by the following situation. Paul's older sister thinks she's always right. All the sisters tend to do this. Um, but in the morning, she's always the last one to use the bathroom and often leaves the light on. Her mother has repeatedly told her that she's wasting electricity. On the way to the bus, Paul notices that the light in the bathroom is on again. So if you were Paul, what would you do? The focus here is on reflecting about the importance of reliability, keeping to established rules, maybe, but also on thinking about values such as solidarity and the environment. So again, there is no right answer to what Paul should do, but it gives a situation where the, where the pupils in the class can discuss. And this, again, gives opportunity for interaction between teacher and pupil, sort of bringing down the barrier of the frontal teaching. Value dilemmas are particularly suitable for considering different positions and perspectives, developing one's own point of view, and eventually taking a responsible decision. Judgment and personal initiative, these are both immensely important values. So, the faculty of judgment, which is so much promoted by STEM uh, topics in general, can also extend in the, to the moral area. In Germany, we have recently launched a project in which methods of service learning or learning through engagement are combined with the teaching of natural science and technology and inquiry-based learning. With the aid of Experimento, pupils learn about natural science, in their lessons, and then they go on to apply what they have learned in a joint project. For example, they conduct a project to improve energy efficiency in, the, in a nearby orphanage, or they program an app that allows them to monitor their own water consumption. So they, they use what they have learned for a community-related um, application of their knowledge. So what is crucial here is that the pupils act independently, so that they themselves define the project, they themselves prepare and implement it. It has to be their own. If that happens, this whole thing reinforces what they have learned, and the practical implementation serves to promote teamwork and social engagement. Experimento is now being used in 11 countries on three continents, touching about 400,000 pupils, and um, we receive vital support um, by local Siemens companies. In each of the countries, we collaborate closely with local experts and educational partners. So here in Chile, these partners are Universidad de Chile, and Jorge 
thank you very, very much for all your support and, and also for organizing this fantastic conference. It's just so inspiring. Thank you. Other partners? Yeah. Other partners are, uh, include Pontificia, Uni uh, Pontificia Universitat Católica, Fundación Chile, Pontificia Universitat Católica Valparaíso. But there are also other partners in this room, like you, Guillermo, where are you, where is he? There, there he is. Um, thank you so much for your support and help in Mexico. It's, I, I don't know where we were without you. Thank you. <laughs> but let me express to all of you distinguished, guests and experts. Um, it is a great, great honor for us from Siemens Stiftung to be able to speak amongst you. Two weeks ago, we invited Experimento partners and multipliers to the first Pan-American network meeting of Experimento at the Centro de Innovación here in Santiago. We, we tend to do a lot here in Santiago. We, we like the place. <laughs> Um, the meeting was attended by 44 educational experts from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Germany. They held intensive discussions about how we can promote a sound education in the natural sciences and technology from a very early age, how we can train enough to qualified teachers and provide them with suitable teaching and learning materials, and how we can collaborate even better and exploit synergies. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that the only way w um, we can exploit synergies, utilize materials in an optimum fashion and guarantee the quality of, um, uh, of uh, ex educational measures is by the extensive exchange of know-how and experience and through effective cooperation. And this within the framework of national, cross-regional and global networks. One example which was also uh, mentioned um, of this kind is the national, national STEM forum in Germany. This comprises over 30 non-profit institutions, such as universities, Max Planck Institute, Fraunhofer Institutes, associations, unions, and a number of foundations, all working closely together to promote STEM education in general and encourage more young people to take up technical careers and study courses. The National STEM Forum was founded four years ago. It is a small-scale small model of German society because all partners come from civil society and they represent very different societal backgrounds, as well as different areas of expertise. So this encourages best practice sharing, but it also ensures that when we communities, uh, communicate, especially with politics, it is both neutral and credible, because there are no particular interests from big corporates or, or, or different particular groups of people. So this is really a, a model of the society. A plenary meeting is held every year to talk about current issues and developments. Last year's meeting was focused on vocational training. This year's event, to be held in June, will have the motto, Seizing Digital Opportunities, Overcoming the Digital Divide. The fact that German Chancellor Angela Merkel will, be, uh, will give a keynote is evidence of the importance of digital license, uh, digitalization for the country's future development. But only, not only for our country, I believe it's for everybody around the world. So um, the, the, the forum, the, 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 the summit will be entirely in German, but if some of you are free to come and want to join, I would like to invite. So one thing is clear, digitalization will change all our lives thoroughly and irreversibly, at a speed we never have experienced before, and to an extent that completely exceeds our powers of imagination. This is, is it better like this? Okay, thanks so much. <laughs> in this way, digitalization causes a paradigm shift similar to genetics, as we heard yesterday. This is just, it's just so different from everything. I mean, I remember when I went to school, I didn't even have, have a telephone, so and I, I, I didn't have a computer. So recently, I attended an extremely interesting presentation by Andrew McAfee, the co-director of the MIT Institute for Digital Business. Probably many of you know him. In his speech, he recalled the legend about the invention of the game of chess. 
This is said to have occurred in the 6th century in the area that we know now as India. According to the legend, the inventor was commissioned to create the game by the, the emperor. As a reward for his efforts, the inventor demanded only a small amount of rice. This amount should comprise, cr comprise one grain of rice on the first square of the, the chessboard, two grains on the second square, four on the third, and a further doubling of the number right up to the 64th square. Being rather weak in mathematics, the emperor initially regarded this as a very modest price. However, he soon learned that the final amount would be an unimaginable quantity of rice. If he had fully acceded to the inventor's request, the emperor would have needed more than 18 quintillion grains, a mountain of rice equivalent to the size of Mount Everest. The legend goes on to say that the emperor ordered the inventor of chess being beheaded. McAfee uses this legend to illustrate Moore's law. Starting in 1958, the year in which IT investments were first recorded in the USA, the, um, uh, computer, the, uh, the computer performance has doubled every 18 months. 2006 saw this happen for the 32nd time. So, completing the first half of the chessboard. Since 2006, we have been filling the second half of the chessboard with digital technologies. And that's when things start to go just as crazy as the amount of rice. Mm? No. A few weeks ago, we read how Google's AlphaGo software was able to beat the world's best Go player after only three games of the best of five series. Far more complex than chess, the game of Go was long thought to be too difficult for a computer to master. The number of potential moves is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. The developers started by programming 30 million moves into the computer and then allowed the machine to play against itself over and over again. So it works with a network inside representing something like our neuron system. This makes AlphaGo an artificial intelligence self-learning program that improves the more it plays. Truly fascinating. But some re reactions have been less enthusiastic and people have responded with two warnings about two main aspects. First, if we create something that can become more intelligent than we are, it may also be able to independently refine itself even further and create new technologies of its own, and without any feelings to hold it back. Artificial intelligence is to design to do what it is programmed for without worrying about collateral damages. As soon as an AI program realizes that deactivation means it cannot achieve its objective, it will find ways to prevent being deactivated. And we all remember the wonderful film, The Odyssey, through the universe. Second, artificial intelligence is taking over more and more tasks that were previously reserved for human beings, with obvious consequences for job seekers and repercussions for job quality. The opportunities for low-skilled workers will decline even further, and the prosperity gap will widen. So, McAfee is less concerned with the possibility of singularity. Well, in the end, we might master computing also this. Um, but he is more afraid of the revolution that might take place once society starts to have too many losers. And there are many um, industries or, or job families where people believe that up to 90% of the current jobs will be done by machines and drones in the future. So we need to work together to prevent both of these things, the singularity and the revolution, and rather benefit from the potential and, and, and the good use of the technology than facing only the fear. Facing up to the future will require our children to be creative and extremely flexible. According to a study by the United States Department of Labor, 
65% of our children will have a profession that doesn't exist yet. This means they will need a sound education in the basics and must then be able and willing to continue learning new things right through to old or age. But not only individuals will need to constantly adapt and learn, also institutions and societies. I believe we need more educational alliances across national boundaries. Um, collaboration within countries is an absolute necessity, whereas international collaboration is the icing on the cake, leading on to the next level. International alliances have already been shown to open up new horizons in many aspects of life, whether it be business, science or sport. And the collective impact of the people, the group gathered in this room, is the best proof of this. But still, schooling is one of the few areas in which we still find predominantly national or even regional um, solutions. I want to make it clear that I'm not calling for a world curriculum or something of the like. The situations and challenges and also the cultural backgrounds in the various countries are too diverse for this. What I would like to see is a, a much broader constructive global networking that enables us to cope with the second half of the chessboard. The second half of the chessboard, its challenges and its opportunities do not stop at national borders. There's a good example of this. Mario Molino's revelations about the effects of hydrofluorocarbon, hydrofluorocarbons uh, on the ozone layer were a real spur to climate protection. And we saw how things can really change for the better when the world community acts. The ozone layer is not our worry anymore. But in a way, I have the feeling that was also the last time the world cooperated on, on such thing. Um, and this is, it's too long without another of these results. So my hope is that we work together in the same global way with regard to inquiry-based learning, starting with STEM, but also going on for general schooling. With this, we can make sure that every child on this planet has access to good education. Because good education is not something we can grant or withhold at, at our discretion. Good education is something that we owe to the next generation. And with all you fine scholars in this room, I hope that this conference is another, another push in this direction of working closely together. Thank you. Thank you.